this, you know, so this is the first of um, four lectures on networks and economics. Uh, Matt is going to speak uh, today and tomorrow, and then Ben is going to follow. And, uh, um, and if you don't, again, we'll follow the same format. Of, you know, if you have any questions about the rotation, about the statement of the results or interpretation, please feel free to ask. Great, thanks, and thanks to the organizers. Um, Pleasure to be here. So, as Amin said, I'm going to talk about networks and economics, and today it'll be actually networks and game theory. So it'll be pretty much purely um, game theory, and then tomorrow will be more on learning and mod simple models of, of learning. And just in terms of putting this in perspective, part of the reason in social scientists are interested in in networks and graphs is that uh, understanding how people interact and understanding their decisions and behaviors depends heavily on understanding the patterns in which they interact. And we've seen that this morning in terms of you know, diffusion and, and contagion processes. Um, we'll talk a little bit more tomorrow about learning processes. Um, these are processes that are somewhat strategic in the sense that they don't involve people making correlated decisions or interdependent decisions. Whereas a lot of peer effects involve um, making predictions about how other people are going to behave. So whether or not you want to adopt a new technology or whether you want to speak a certain language depends on whether other people around you are speaking that language or whether they're uh, adopting that technology. And so that produces certain patterns of behaviors and that's what I'm going to spend uh, most of the time on today. So peer influence and choices and behaviors, you care about peers, peers act and this, you know, in quotes, this is more recently people start talking about complex contagion and so forth. Uh, the idea here is that you've got these interacting systems which produce thresholds, which make the analysis different from um, processes that are going to be um, a, a little bit more um, dy straight dynamic um, in, in certain ways. And we'll say more about that as we go along. Okay, uh, peer effects. We're, there's lots of different ways in which people affect each other. Information we learn from people around us opportunities we get from people around us, whether or not you have a chance to get an interview for a job, um, whether or not you get recommended for a job, depends on you know, your advisor. Um, there's all kinds of things that, that depend on the, the networks. Um, but what we're gonna focus most of our time on today is these last two, which is the idea that, that, that norms, traditions, cultures, um, behavior are, are dependent on what other people are doing. There's complementarities in those behaviors and uh, coordinating using the same technology, et cetera, um, depends on what other people are doing. So what I'm gonna do is I'm, I'm gonna presume that, that people are um, novices to game theory. I know that's uh, very wrong for some of you and probably correct for, for many others. So there'll be zero assumptions about people's previous knowledge of game theory. And I'll try and make it self-contained on that dimension, but please you know, stop me if anything doesn't seem perfectly clear. So uh, we'll start with a very special case but it's one that has lots of examples associated with it. So people are either choosing to adopt a technology, choosing one or not. Um, they're choosing to become educated, they're choosing not to become educated. They're choosing to speak a certain language or not. So it's zero one choices and the payoff depends on how many neighbors are choosing the action and what your own, um, you know, how many neighbors you have and then what your own decision is. So this is a, you know, a special case, but it's, it's a, a important special case. So each person chooses an action in zero one, and then you're gonna consider situations where the payoffs, we're gonna have a special kind of payoff to this. So each person is gonna get some benefit from, from making this choice, which depends on what their degree is. So how many friends do I have? What my choice is? And then this M, N of I is, what's the number of people in my neighborhood in the graph? How many friends do I have who are also taking this action? So if I'm gonna try and, uh, you know, learn to play a certain video game, how many of my friends, how many friends do I have? And then how many of them are actually playing the video game? Uh, more people playing that video game makes it more likely that I wanna play that video game uh, myself. Okay, so that's the basic structure to these kinds of preferences. And then we wanna understand um, the behaviors. So let's start with a, you know, a few examples. Really simple one, let's take some graph, there's some network. Each one of these is a person, they're making a choice. They're either going to adopt this new technology or not. And suppose that the payoffs are such that a person prefers to adopt the new technology if at least 40% of their friends do. 
So it's a relatively good technology. They don't need half their friends, they just need 40% to adopt it. Um, and then the question is what, what would ha actually happen on this graph? Okay, so we can say, well, there's you know, a bunch of different possible outcomes of, of stable points that could eventually happen on this graph. So if we look for an equilibrium point, this would be one, these three people adopt, nobody else does. That each one of these has at least 40% of their friends adopting, so they're all happy to take the technology up. None of their, uh, these other people have fewer than 40%, so that's an equilibrium, okay? So that's one equilibrium. When you look at this graph, there's many equilibria, right? So here, here's another equilibrium, um, and there's gonna be a bunch of them. So this is a game um, here in this particular example of, of complementarities. This person's willing to choose one, if and only at least some fraction of neighbors do. In this case, the, it was 40%. So here, if you look at the utility, one way to do this would be, we normalize the utility of not taking adoption to zero. One payoff that would give this kind of behavior is, just look at the fraction of my friends, and then the payoff to adopting is fraction of my friends adopting minus 0.4. Okay, that would give you payoffs that would yield this. There could be lots of different payoffs, different benefits and costs to this game that would yield this kind of behavior where the threshold would be 40%. Okay. So um, a Nash equilibrium in terms of this game. So think of people, people are making choices. In this case, it's a zero one choice. So each person has an action space that they can either choose a zero or one. They're making a choice. So each person's choosing this XI, either they're zero or one, and they're getting some payoff from this, which is based on their own payoff and the payoff of the others. So the definition of a Nash equilibrium is just a point such that we're gonna specify what everybody in the society does. And each person is making the best possible choice given the choices of the others. So their, action, their payoff from choosing the action they're choosing is at least as good as they could from changing their, their um, decision. Okay, is that clear? Okay, so that's the basic Nash equilibrium and we're gonna be looking at those in, in this um, talk today. Okay, so if we look back at that graph we had before, the, there's a bunch of different equilibria to that where everybody who adopts has at least 40% of their friends adopting, all the people who don't have fewer than 40% of their friends adopting, there's a lattice to those equilibria. So the set of equilibria in that particular game form a lattice. This is the lattice for that particular network and for that particular um, threshold. Okay. okay, so that's one kind of game. That's a, a prevalent game. Um, so lots of peer effects have this kind of feature that the more of my friends Take the action the more I want to take it. Yeah, Christian. Because when you describe that you just say everybody who has adopted it has at least 40 percent, everybody who doesn't has less. But that was not your definition of the flip. It was that if I would change, would it get better? Which is a different notion. So this doesn't show to me yet that these are right, right. So so if we go back to this payoff here, so let's suppose that this is the payoff function. So if anybody in this, in, said take one of these, these particular equilibria, change what, this person, they have 40%, um, they have half of their friends taking the action. So if they changed, so right now they're getting a positive payoff. If they change their action to a zero, they will get a negative payoff or a zero payoff. So each one of these people has a positive payoff from taking it. Each one of these people, if they changed, they would get a negative payoff. Right, because the fewer than 40%. So if we go back to that definition um, with that 40% threshold, in, in this case, if anybody, if anybody else here, any of these um, non-green nodes change to being green, they would get a negative payoff. So they would, they would not wanna do that. And the green nodes are getting a strictly positive payoff. None of them wants to change. Yeah, so in this particular case, a, these are all equilibrium according to that Nash equilibrium definition. Yes. Sorry, so I understand there are a number of different equilibria for this thing, but in this picture, are you somehow indicating that these equilibria are related to each other or that one is? Yeah, so, so when I say a lattice of equilibria, a lattice is going to be a, uh, a set of objects such that when you look at pairs of objects, you can order them. And so here, let's suppose that we just look at, that we look at the set of people taking the actions. We just code that as a vector, these vectors of zeros and ones. And here, this is a vector of all zeros, right? Nobody's taking the action. Up here is a vector of all ones, everybody's taking the action. 
And these lines indicate that we've increased in the vector, the vector has increased. So this one is a bigger vector than this one. This one is a bigger vector than this one. So each one of these is a bigger vector than the one down here. And a lattice is such that if you take any set of equilibria, there's always something which is at least as big as it, and something which is at least as small as any, any part, part of it. And so this is a, a complete, I mean, it's a finite lattice, so it's going to be complete, but this is a lattice, nice lattice structure. So the join and meet operations are affecting union and intersection. Exactly, exactly. And so here you can see, you know, and there's some interesting ones here. For instance, there's sort of an extra equilibrium. Um, here you can you can have the, these two alone be in equilibrium, or you can have these five be in equilibrium. You can't have these three separately from this two be in equilibrium. So the lattice is a little bit asymmetric in, in this particular example. So it's an interesting lattice in, in some ways. I have one mathematical question in this uh, Nash equilibria. In, if you look at this lattice, is it clear that we will have a unique uh, maxima, maximum? Yes. Is, is, is part of the Nash Exactly. So the nice thing about a lattice is it has a, a, a unique maximum point and a unique minimum point. So it's a complete lattice. So there's a well defined maximum and a well defined minimum point. And then for any set, there's a maximum, and you can find a point which is. Uh, least upper bound and a greatest lower bound. That's not true for any lattice, right? It's not true for any lattice. It's true in, in this finite set. Um, we have it's a complete lattice. So so there'll be a theorem that in games of complements, um, the each set of equilibria will be a complete lattice in this in these again you game on a network with these complementarities, the set of equilibria will be a complete lattice. So by complete you mean that it's a unique lower bound and a unique upper bound? Oh, I know. So completeness means take any any set of equilibria. There exists a well-defined least upper bound for that set. So, for instance, if I take these two equilibria, this is the least upper bound. And if I take these two, this is the the uh, lower bound. So, pick any set of equilibria, and you can find something which is the least upper bound to it and the greatest lower bound. Other questions. Okay, so, so games of complements have lots of different possibilities. And, and that's part of you know, what's interesting about things going viral. Sometimes things don't spread. You don't get, you know, and good technology doesn't spread at all. Other times it spreads widely. So this kind of multiplicity is a fact of nature and understanding that there's multiplicity and understanding what these look like can allow us to, you know, for instance, set policies and say, okay, look, you know, this is a good technology, but we're stuck here. We wanna get here, how do we get there? Right? So that's the kind of thing that the reason that we're interested in these kinds of things from an economist point of view is, you know, how can we understand where we got stuck and why we got stuck there and can we influence things? Okay. So another example, so um, which is much less well behaved is what's known as a best shot public, public goods game. And so let me just explain what this kind of game is. So imagine um, the simple example is uh, you buy a book. Okay, you, if you buy a book, you can read the book. If your friend has a book, the same book, you can borrow it from your friend and you don't have to pay the price for the book. Okay, so think of, of a product where you can either buy it directly by yourself at some cost, or you can borrow it from a friend. And so what you would, in terms of your payoffs, there's a benefit to reading the book, there's a cost to reading the book. And in this case, um, I would prefer to buy it if none of my friends have the book. So this is a book I want to read. I'll buy it if nobody, if none of my friends do. But if one of my friends has it, I'd prefer not to buy the book. I'd prefer to borrow it. Okay, we'll go, we'll go through the payoffs a little later, but just, you know, it's pretty direct to see, you know, here, I want to do it if none of my friends are active. I want to be active. I want to buy the book. If one of my friends buys the book, I don't want to. That's what's known as a best shot public goods game. So there's benefits from other people taking the action. So here, if you start thinking about equilibria, here's an equilibrium to this game. Okay, these people buy the book, their friends free ride. So any one of these other people can borrow the book from, from one of these. All these people have no friends that have the book, right? So they're all gonna buy the book. Um, this is actually what's in graph theory is known as a maximal independent set. So the, the equilibria of a best shot public goods game are equal to the maximal independent sets of the graph. 
So, so here there's a set of independent nodes, no, no, no two of them are connected and it's maximal in the sense that you know, everybody here already is connected to somebody and these people are connected to people who haven't bought the book. So that's all stable, okay? So this kind of game, here's another equilibrium, does not have a lattice structure. So it's much worse behaved in terms of its mathematics. Lattices are very nice objects. It's easy to find lower bounds. You can take intersections. And as Amin was saying, you know, intersections and unions will make a lattice structure very easy. It's easy to find these equilibria. It's much nicer object mathematically. These kinds of objects are, are trickier. And in fact, you know, obviously finding the, the full set of equilibria on a graph here is an NP hard problem um, in, in, not, uh, in, in, a, in a hard sense. Okay, so example of the best shot, you could say, okay, payoff of, if I don't take the, I don't buy the book, that's action zero. One, if someone in my neighborhood is, has, has bought the book. So if at least one person has bought the book, I get a one, a zero if nobody has. And then if I buy the book, I get the one from reading it, but I pay the cost C. Okay, so that would be an example of a best shot public goods, but there could be many other different payoffs that would correspond to these kinds of games. Okay. So these are two examples of games on networks. Um, and here, this you know, best shot public goods are the maximal independent set. So independent set, set of nodes such that no two nodes are linked to each other in the set. Maximal, every node in N is either in S or linked to a node in S. The equilibria here are exactly a maximal independent set. Okay. Um, okay, so these are some basic definitions and examples. Now I want to talk about strategic complements and substitutes and sort of, I think this is the important conceptual meat of what I'm going to talk about and, and sort of defining this. And I'll do it very, in very simple games where we're just doing these zero one choices. And so what are the first concept externalities, which is sort of the bread and butter of economics. What does externality mean? It means that other behaviors affect my utility or welfare. So whether or not somebody else is buying this book uh, affects my welfare. Um, whether or not somebody else smokes affects my welfare, whether else somebody else is making noise late at night. So other people's decisions and actions um, affect me. And game theory is the, the fact that their decisions or actions not only affect my utility or welfare, but affect the relative payoffs to different things. So I want to change what I do in response to what other people are doing. Okay. So externalities mean they affect me. And the interesting part of game theory is they affect me differently depending on what action I'm taking. And, and we'll go through some examples here. Okay, so let's think about these strategic substitutes. This is like the um, best shot public goods game. This was a case, friend does not buy the book. If I buy it, I'm gonna get a benefit minus the cost. Friend buys it, doesn't matter if I bought it, I'm still paying the benefit minus the cost. Um, here, if the friend doesn't buy it, I get a zero. And if I don't buy it, and then if I buy it, if I don't buy it and the friend buys it, I get a B. Okay, so where's the externality here? The externality is the fact that the friend's decision affects my payoff when I don't buy it, right? So that's where the externality is. And here it's a pos what's known as a positive externality. So the friend buying it improves my welfare. So I'm getting a better payoff when they buy it than what I didn't. Okay, so that's a, a positive um, externalities. Sorry. So here, so just in terms of the equilibrium structure, the reason that this was a hard game to analyze was that we have sort of this reversal. The friend doesn't buy it, I wanna buy it. Friend buys it, I don't wanna buy it, right? So you've got this mismatch in uh, behaviors and that's what causes the equilibrium structure to be more complicated. Okay, so that's strategic substitutes. Strategic complements, when we look to say, um, you know, I, I get a benefit of, of playing, learning to play a game or adopting this technology if my friend does as well, then here, if the friend doesn't, I invest in this game or technology, I just pay the cost C, I don't have anybody to play it with. They play it, I get the benefit minus the cost. Um, if I don't invest at all, I get zeros. So here the externality is, is on the top. So the difference between that, those two games was where this externality was. It's a positive externality, but in this case, it's on my, my decision to, to play or buy or adopt. In the other case, it was on the other decision. Okay. Other questions about this concept? Okay. So that's strategic complements, and we'll be more explicit about this in a minute. Um, 
Yeah. Discussions when we when we talk about and producing a good and pollutes environment, we often talk about the externality. But there you talk typically I understand it as externality to society and not to so is there a similar notion of externalities as a social welfare instead of the payoffs of people or yeah so um in, in a network setting usually what we're thinking of is the people around you know we define as the friends or the people in the graph as the people who actually impact me. More generally it could be if we're thinking about something like you know um, pollution uh, you know, a factory moving, then that decision is going to impact possibly a whole large group of people. And so you could put that into a network, but more generally, when we think about externalities, you know, the early literature on externalities was about big pollution questions and things like that. But externalities are pretty much at play, are the thing that make most of the economic decisions interesting. So they're at play in the micro scale as well as the macro scale. And, and they're sort of the, you know, really what defines game theory. Without these externalities, you know, it's, it's the single person's decision making because nobody else affects my payoff. Like that, you know, it doesn't matter what other people are doing. So this is where all the action is in game theory. Yeah, so one other thing, you know, people sort of think, okay, um, you know, when, you can do this with negative externalities as well. So you can have a strategic game of compliments with negative externalities. So here's an example, um, doping. So think of people in athletic competition and there's a possibility that they can take drugs, dope to cheat, okay? So here, if your competitor doesn't cheat, you don't cheat, let's normalize the payoff to zero. So it's an even match. Now, if your competitor doesn't and you dope, um, there's a benefit to winning minus the cost of doping. And, and here, let's assume that this is a, a person who doesn't have moral cost to doping. So they're just getting a positive benefit from doping. Okay, so they would choose, if their comp competitor doesn't, they would choose to dope. Okay, where's the negative externality? The negative externality is if they don't dope and their competitor does, they're gonna lose and there's some loss. Right, and it could be a large loss. So effectively, they're gonna be ineffective. They have no chance in the competition. They get a negative payoff if their uh, competitor dopes and they don't. And so then if, they, if their competitor dopes and they do dope, um, they're gonna get a, a minus C here. So they're gonna end up with a, a negative payoff compared to what they could have gotten if they both didn't dope, because now they're back in a stalemate, but they're both doping. Um, but this is a game where there's a negative externality to it. Doping actually hurts me, um, but we end up with an equilibrium where everybody dopes okay, or, or tests, you know, unless you're testing and do other kinds of things. And unless you have moral reasons for not doing it, this is a basic structure of this kind of game. So these games of compliments don't have to have positive externalities. They could also, you know, you, the reason you're doing these things is because other people are doing it and it has a negative impact if you don't do it is another reason it could happen. This looks like the prisoner's dilemma. It has a prisoner's dilemma sort of flavor to it. Um, it's, it's a, it has a similar structure in the sense that we're both taking these actions, even though we'd rather not. But if the other person doesn't, then we will. So it does, it is, it has the same strategic structure as a prisoner's dilemma. Yes. Is it different payoff Well, I mean, you, you, yeah, I mean, it's, you could transform this into a prisoner's dilemma. Um, you could tell the same story as a, this is basically, um, not confessing, um, doping is is confessing, and basically you both you both end up confessing. So this is a, it has the same structure as a prisoner's dilemma. Yes. My question. So, um, so because the loss was denoted L, but also like the difference in the columns, it, it's just negative C and B minus C. Is that supposed to kind of imply that the or like L is the same magnitude as B, or is that? Yeah, so here I put, for instance, um, you know, depending on whether, the, so in terms of analyzing the welfare of this, um, if, if L is big, I sort of put a big arrow here. Often what the stories of doping are this, is that, you know, effectively you're put out of competition if you don't do it, and then your loss could be enormous. And, and so this is a, a much bigger loss than okay. sort of the benefits. And, and that's often the reason that, you, that, that it's so hard to eradicate doping in professional sports. Okay, in strategic substitutes, um, you can have a negative externality as well. 
and that's you know sort of your classic congestion games. So think of uh, I'm not going to show up. The other person is not going to show up. So imagine you know we're, we're trying to use um, one like we're trying to use a printer um, in the same time. If two of us are trying to use it, it congests it. So I, I don't use it. The other person doesn't use it. I get zero payoff. Other person doesn't. I get a benefit for it. Um, the negative externality here is when the other person shows up, um, I lose my benefit from actually um, using the resource, right? So there's more congestion. Uh, if we both show up, then we lose it. So, you know, th there can be positive or negative externalities. And then the, the complementarities and strategic substitutes are whether or not my, my relative payoff is bigger or smaller, depending on what the other person wants to do. So strategic complements, so complementarities means that when you look at more action from my neighbors compared to less action, then my payoff from taking the action has, is relatively larger, right? So you look at my relative change in, in, in uh, taking the payoffs from taking the action versus not, that gets bigger the more people uh, in, the, in the rest of the population to take it or in my neighborhood. And then strategic substitutes is exactly the opposite. Uh, do you also consider settings where your what happens to you doesn't depend only on the neighbors, but for example, in the Julie depression on what happens to the neighbor of neighbors, or what if you have weights on the graph and things like that? Yes, um, so I'll, I'll do some examples a little later on, but already these things end up being tied. So here the payoffs aren't directly tied to that, but whether yes. my neighbor takes that action is dependent on what exactly. And so, for instance, if we go back to these games. You know, this one. Yes, of course, but right eventually it gets even more complex if you have some like deleted. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'm gonna I'm gonna go through um, a specific continuous action game a little later, where what's gonna happen is my my benefit's gonna depend on the amount of action my neighbors take, and the amount of action they take is gonna depend on their neighbors' actions and so forth, and it, it'll decay. So I'll, there'll be indirect effects, and we'll we'll actually look at. How your position in the network determines how much action you take. And you consider sometimes cases where there's some weights on the edges, for example. And yes, yeah, 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 yeah. So I'll, we'll do an example exactly like that. We'll do a special case of that. We'll do a linear quadratic form of that, but we'll do a very um, a, a version where there's going to be weights and directed and continuous actions and other kind of things. So these sort of simple examples are to give the motivation and basic intuitions about how payoffs work and so forth, and then we'll get into more detail on those. Okay, so compliments, choice to take an action by my, my friends increases my relative payoff to taking it, substitutes the opposite. Um, and compliments, there's lots of different examples of this, smoking and other behavior among teens, technology adoption, education, learning language, corruption and crime, cheating, doping, et cetera. Substitutes, um, information gathering. So, you know, if one of my friends actually learns to do something and I can piggyback off them or free ride off them, um, then that can be beneficial. Um, students studying in study groups often, if somebody else does the homework problem, then uh, they don't do it themselves. You know, so there, there's possibilities of that. Competing firms, oligopolies with local uh, markets. So um, whether or not a, a firm, another firm enters a market um, can cause me damage. Um, vaccinations. So this happens, and this is one of the reasons that vaccinations are very hard. Near herd immunity, you know, once everybody else is vaccinated and we've gotten herd immunity, my incentive to vaccinate goes down dramatically. If it's costly or I'm worried about vaccinating and it's very, very hard to keep a population, you know, once the, the disease drops to close to zero, people start to tend to start dropping their vaccinations. And then, so you get these kinds of seesaw motions and that can be um, reminiscent of, a, of this kind of um, strategic substitutes game. Okay, useful observations, um, compliments. So if you look at my degree and, and we all have the same basic structure of payoff as a function of degrees and neighbors actions, then there's gonna be some threshold such that I prefer to take one um, if the number of people in my neighborhood is above that threshold and take action zero if it's below that threshold. So in this compliments game, more of my friends taking it, the more I wanna take it. Um, substitutes, it goes the opposite way. Um, so up to now, I thought that each vertex has a degree di, and now it's d. These are examples of average degree of the whole. All oh, right. So um, this, yes. Yeah, so sorry. Uh, this is a function of, of the generic degree, but yes, it should be a di. 
Yeah, yes, um, yeah, yeah. there should be right? eyes on uh, yeah. eyes on these. Speech these. Eye. Yeah, exactly. So each I look at my degree, and then I, I have a threshold that's based on that. And then, if you look at this kind of a threshold behavior, usually there is a single parameter governing whole, uh, say, graph. Like uh, if you talk about the probability, then there might be some average degree that determines. Is this such a phenomenon as well for, for given a graph? You do kind of complements whatever. And is there such a threshold value independent of the each vertex? Um, Global parameter. So what you can talk well, about is there's partial orderings. So what you end up with is you can end up with, uh, with statements about whether something. So let's suppose we ask a question of here's a technology. There's thresholds for different people adopting it. Will it spread? Uh, you could answer that question, you know, and, and suppose we've got like these first 10 people have adopted. Um, depending on what those thresholds look like as a function of the graph, you okay. might or might not get it, but there's different functions that would like the eigenvalue. If you look at the eigenvalue, it governs the global parameter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll I'll show you some things. We'll, we'll get one more, which will be very closely related to an eigen uh, eigenvalue, uh, eigenvector calculation. Mm -hmm. But I guess the point here is your game is defined pairwise. Pairwise, oh, locally, it's very local. local right? Uh, well, so the any correlation over the network is spread, but the game is just defined on the yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the game, each one of these people is looking at whether what's how many people in my neighborhood are taking the action. That's all I care about. So I just care about whether or not my friends are playing the video game. It's really local, uh, local game. Yeah, these are all local games, but then these local games spill over to each other because whether my friends play it depends on how many friends they have and how many of their friends are adopting it and so forth. Yeah. Now, this is sort of the fact that, I mean, it could be that I care about some diversity or so, right? So maybe you have more than, maybe I care that I have sort of a friend which likes the opera yeah. and a friend who likes sports so that I can actually. Yeah, you can, you can have mixed externality games. So, you know, you can have different, um, uh, you, you, you might, you know, have positive or some middle point that you like and so forth. Those are even harder to analyze than these versions of these. So these will be pretty. Uh... I mean, I'm sick now, right? If I want to produce a car, also, right? I need sort of, I need an engine, I need wheels, I need sort of, but having two neighbors which produce wheels doesn't help. And yeah. so I need sort of a certain, or if I want to produce a interdisciplinary paper, I need a social scientist and a mathematician that. Right, right. Be, so. Yeah, yeah. So here, um, the here in this particular specification that we're talking about so far, the neighbors are generic in the sense that they're all interchangeable, and I just care about the number. So what we've looked at in terms of these examples so far was just I care about how many of my friends, but I don't have differences between my friends. And you can also, you know, the, so this is just a couple of examples that are going to be useful. But you could label these so that my payoff depends on which ones of my neighbors, and I get a payoff which is twice as high if this person takes the action as, as if this person, um, you can have interactions between those. So you can specify any payoff function you want in one of these games. Whether or not it's gonna be tractable to analyze depends on how you know, simple the game structure is and what kinds of graph structures we're working with and, and so forth. But you, you can specify an arbitrary payoff function in really cool. Do you, do you, sorry, because if it's a, it rings a bell. Have you heard about so called booster population? It seems like very much related to booster population, isn't it, Christian? Bootstrap population. Oh, bootstrap population. Bootstrap, bootstrap population. Yeah, so it's complex contagion. It's complex contagion. Yeah. The outcome is basically the same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So this will exhibit, com this will have complex, com exactly. So these, these games will have complex contagion because the whether or not things are spreading through a particular neighborhood are going to depend on people hitting thresholds, not just having one interaction. So it, it, it will be exactly that. Okay, so um, equilibrium existence and structure. Again, Nash equilibrium, every player's action is optimal for um, that player given the actions of others. Generally, we're gonna look at what's known as pure strategy equilibrium, meaning people will just take an action or not, or they're, they're, maybe they have a, a finite set of actions. I can choose one of three technologies. Um, another possibility is I randomize. So you can have the action spaces be measures instead of, of um, you know, discrete uh, spaces. 
um, in network games often we'll look for pure strategy equilibria, but sometimes you need uh, these things to be measures as opposed to um, pure strategies. Simple setting of just sort of mean depending on the degree and do we know that we always have equilibrium here? Yeah, so here's answer to that question. Um, this is a very general one. Take any game, specify whatever payoffs you want. Um, if it has strategic complements, meaning that the if you increase the actions of my neighbors, then my payoff from taking higher actions goes up. So let's suppose individual strategy spaces are complete lattices. So everybody has a lattice as an action space. So that means it could be a very, you know, it, it could be a, a complex, it could be like taking seven different actions and, and taking a whole vector of actions. As long as my payoffs go up from taking higher actions in this lattice, as other people take higher actions in the lattice, then the set of pure equilibria exists, it's not empty, and it forms a complete lattice. So that basic lattice structure of the games just comes out of the fact that complementarities are nicely ordered games. Higher actions by other people in a, in a very broad sense, just stay, I've got this vector of actions, you increase that vector, I get higher payoffs from taking higher vectors myself, then everything works and you get um, a nice structure to the equilibria, it's gonna be non-empty and it's gonna be a complete lattice. Okay, so complements have really nice structures for write down whatever utility function you want for whatever combinations of, of your friends and so forth, you get a nice structure out. So, and just for people who don't know complete lattice, every set of equilibria, there exists an X prime such as greater than or equal to for all of it, and uh, a, a least, uh, a greatest lower bound. Okay, contrasts, these games of complements have really nice equilibrium structure, it's always not empty. Games of substitutes, well, that best shot public goods game, a very special case, pure strategy equilibria exists and, and are related to maximum independent sets, but more generally, they might not exist. They could, it's possible you get no equilibria because when the other person wants to take it, I don't. And then when I don't, you can get kind of cycle, cycle um, games. Pure strategy may not exist. Mixed strategy will with finite action spaces. And, um, generally equilibria will not form uh, a lattice. They, um, when you have multiplicity, they generally won't form a lattice. So do you really need finite action space? So it does not if it's some, I don't know, polish. You, you can do it with, yeah, you can do it with a more general, usually this is done with some kind of space of measures that have nice continuity properties. And then, um, so, you know, anything, so if you go back to Kakutani, usually you prove this using Kakutani's fixed point theorem. And so um, it, it's possible to do it in a, in a much more general space than finite action spaces. Okay, so uh, a couple of questions we can just ask about. Let's go back to the coordination games um, where I prefer to take action one if some fraction of people or more take action one. Okay, so we just look at this. That was the 40% game. If at least 40% have adopted, I want to adopt it. Let's look at those classes of games for just a moment. Um, what does the equilibrium structure look like? Well, as we said, let's let some group S of the nodes be the people who have adopted. What has to be true? Everybody in that group S has to have at least Q of their friends in that group S, a fraction Q, and everybody outside has to have at least one minus Q of their friends outside of us in order for this to, to be an equilibrium. So it has to be that the people inside are satisfying the threshold, the people outside are not. And there's a definition um, on a, this is sort of an interesting, it's a useful notion beyond this. And this was first defined by Steve Morris in, in the 2000. And he defined the, the cohesiveness of a given group S on a graph G to be uh, we'll say that a group S is R cohesive. If you look at the minimum fraction of how many people, what's the fraction of friends I have um, inside the group S, if that's bigger than R for everybody in, in S, then we'll say that S is at least R cohesive. And then we'll have um, the cohesiveness of uh, a group S is just the minimum fraction of friends that anybody in that group has in the set. Okay, so if you just look at a set of nodes, you want to ask how cohesive it is. It's sort of 
look at the person who has the fewest fraction, the lowest fraction of their friends in the group, that's the cohesiveness of, of a set of nodes. Right. So for instance, in this graph, both sets of these, both of these two different sets, the reds and greens are, are two thirds cohesive, right? And so they're defined by these two nodes are the critical nodes that have exactly um, two thirds of their, of their friends in. Actually, there's another couple. Okay. So then there exists a pure strategy equilibrium where both actions are played in some graph. If and only if there's a group S that's at least Q cohesive and its complements at least uh, one minus Q cohesive. And so what's interesting about this is this is gonna tell us something about how you cut up a graph and whether or not a graph can sustain multiple equilibria is gonna depend on whether you can partition nodes into sets that are gonna have more connections within those sets than across. So this is gonna be related to community detection, the community detection literature on a graph. Can we find communities of, of nodes that are more connected internally than across? And that allows these equilibria to survive, okay? So here was the, the 40%. If you go through that example, what you can look at is all the equilibria. And actually, if you look at the set of all the equilibria, that divides things into a set of communities such that there are certain communities of nodes that are always doing the same thing, no matter what equilibrium you're looking at, right? So these were all the equilibria of that 40% game on this original graph. You look at the, the sigma algebra generated by that, and that divides up these nodes into communities. And you can, this gives you a foundation for a certain definition of what a community is. These communities have enough sustained fractions inside to always be part of the same equilibrium, but then you get cuts across there, okay? So this is one way of dividing and identifying communities in a graph. So from the game, you can define the communities in the graph. Is that some way to cut your code? These minimal communities, I would sort of intuitively try to collapse the surfaces into one because I would say they have to stick together anyhow. Well, it's have to probably correct for some of the degrees or so to make it still work. Yeah, so actually, what this this does, this helps in, in two things. One is if you want to do an algorithm for, uh, for um, calculating different equilibria, identifying these communities can help in terms of figuring out what the equilibria are. It also helps in seeding algorithms. So if I want to start getting a behavior to take off and I know what the communities are, I know that they're going to um, behave the same. I can say, okay, look, I want to get people playing this video game. Um, what's the best way to you know, start this out? I can start by, by getting certain communities activated and seeing what else happens. But if I understand the equilibrium structure and I understand what the structures look like, then that's help, helpful in a bunch of different, solving a bunch of different problems. So this gives a definition of communities in terms of what, so I don't know how many people know the community detection literature, but there's a community detection literature out there, which is based on different ways of cutting up a graph and saying, these look like the nodes that belong together because they're really densely connected internally and not so connected across. These games give you a, a concrete way of defining that because these are the, you know, the equilibrium structure divides that graph up in terms of what the communities are gonna be. And one thing that's different is this was the set for Q equals 0.4. It turns out if you have any Q between one third and a half, right at a half things can go kind of haywire because of integer constraints. Um, but it, you know, or between a half and, and two thirds, these will be the communities, the, the, the equilibrium splitting of the graph will be the same. Okay. Let me re-ask my question from before. If you have these groups which have to stick together, what does that mean? Structure, as I sort of must say, we know just about the empty set. Um, so, in terms of lattice structure, remember the lattice. Uh, what that means is they're always the same color in every element of the lattice. So it doesn't it doesn't mean so the lattice itself is a lattice over graph of, over sets of the equilibria. So equilibrium themselves. Oh, but what's up with these three people up there, which always the this, they always stick together, but yeah. they don't really have a point in the lattice. Exactly. They, they're, they, exactly. Because so they the never, there, there's the never a point where they're the, yeah, exactly. So you can still be that they're always acting the same, even though they're never in equilibrium alone. Mm -hmm. 
because anytime they're all taking it, then these other two people are also taking it. So you can't have these people taking it without these people also taking the action. So they always act the same, but that doesn't mean that they can sort of be a self-sustaining community where they're the only people taking the action. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So what's interesting about this is different behaviors give you different splits of the graph. So a 40% threshold um, game is different from you know one that it takes something less than a third and bigger than a quarter. This is one where I need fewer, I have a lower threshold of friends before I'm willing to take this action, right? So this is a better technology. If at least you know 25% of my friends take it, I'm willing to take it. Um, that ends up with equilibria that are bigger in this particular case. And that ends up with a different split of the graph. So depending on what behavior you have, you could have different possibilities emerging for how the graph splits up. And then, you know, once Q is really, really low or really, really high, basically it's impossible to get different people in different parts of the graph taking it. If the threshold is so low that once any one of my friends takes it, I'm going to take it, then things are going to spread through the whole graph. Then it's simple contagion, right? So this is simple contagion. Either the whole graph gets infected or, or not at all. Yeah. Is what? Is there any threshold Q so that I will stay in one component? Whatever this complementary strategy you it's a different question. Can you pin down depending on the graph? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you give so um, generally it's hard to know. So wait, one way to let me see if I can understand the question would be give me a graph and then like give me some part of the graph. And say, is there a queue where I can get this part activated and nothing else? Or as a whole, here I, I see that there's there is no chance to have cut, right? Right, right. Yeah. According to the strategy that we are building up, there should be some queue. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, exactly. Before. So what is here? It's one quarter. Yeah. So what's the queue uh, yeah. which does it? Complement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. Yeah. Q, well, one minus Q, is yeah. there a unique value? So the given input, I yeah. can characterize either due to the second eigenvalue or the first eigenvalue, whatever. Yeah, so I, I can answer that question for stochastic block models, but don't know the answer generally. Um, so for certain classes of graphs, there's a well-defined answer, which is the minimum probability of connection across um, components. But I don't know what the answer is for, uh, yeah, because it's, it's, it's more complex. It's more complex than a, uh, an expansion property because it, it yeah, it, um, but the, there might be a relationship between some expander graph properties. Right, and, uh, right. Sugar constant or edge yeah, expander. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, I don't know the answer. It's a, yeah, the problem in general is related to the densest subgraph problem. So, uh, yeah, that makes it a Difficult probably to approximate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, yeah. But you know, when you assume you have a random graph model, some of these things become easier. Exactly. So for stochastic block models, then you can answer these questions because you know exactly what the densities are going to be approximately in the limit. But more generally, I don't know of any simple way of, of encapsulating that. Okay. So so let's uh, just a quick theorem on stochastic block models. Um, so let's think of, we. Um, Christian talked about stochastic block models this morning. So we've got a bunch of different blocks. These are people who are going to have certain characteristics, for instance. Um, you know, these are people who are more likely to connect to each other, possibly. Probability of links from block B to B prime just depends on whether you're in B and B prime, not on anything else about the nodes. So the blocks are enough to determine these probabilities. We'll let this vary with the size of the graph and let the expected degree of uh, a node in group block B to nodes in block B prime be some number. So this is the expected number of connections I'm gonna have if I'm um, you know, from Stanford to people in Berkeley. This would be my expected degree, okay? And then overall expected degree, is there's a degree for um, expected degree for somebody in each block. And we're, 
is just the first p times the size of the it's, exactly yeah i mean first well this is this, this one is actually my overall degree so it's no, the one above. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. This so this is just this is this times the size of, of group b prime yeah and then this one is going to be the sum over all these across the different um, b primes okay and what we're going to assume is that this is at least one plus epsilon log n so that, that the graph you know that at least these blocks are going to be connected components so we won't have splits within the within the blocks um, almost surely as the graph grows okay so that's a large stochastic block model but these probabilities could be arbitrarily varying across these things as long as they satisfy this minimum connectedness within a block and the blocks could be of different sizes etc so that's a large stochastic block model we'll say it's convergent if um sorry not large k this should be large n if the eventually there's some fixed set number of blocks and the relative connectedness that uh, a node has from b to b prime compared to its overall degree converges to some number so how, relatively how connected somebody in block b is to block b prime is a well-defined limit okay so we'll say it's convergent if that's true is that clear? So we've just got a fixed set of blocks, and eventually these relative probabilities are converging nicely. And we're going to bring in homophily. And I don't know how many people know what homophily is. I'm going to talk a lot about homophily tomorrow. Homophily is um, the tendency of people with similar characteristics to connect more to themselves than to other people. We'll say that, it, so, you know, when we look at, at high school students, They'll be heavily segregated by age, by gender, et cetera. Um, weakly homophilus is going to say that the relatively chance that a, a B person has connecting to a B person is higher than a B prime person connecting to a B person, okay, by some epsilon. We have another, sorry, this detailed question. This is the D, D, D the degree between blocks divided by within converges for all. Is this universal? Uh, uh, it converges to one single thing for every or for each pair? For each, for each pair, it converges to something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just for each B, B prime pair, it, yeah. Sorry, so it doesn't converge to the same thing, but for all B and B prime, this thing converges. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It, could be, it could be very heterogeneous in terms of across these things, yeah. but we have a well defined that, that, for instance, you know, if we look at, um, you know, uh, I don't know, math majors and statistics majors and computer science majors, and we're looking at the fraction of math majors with statistics majors, friendships, that doesn't have to be the same as math majors with computer science majors. So we have those friendship groups, the, there's likelihoods, and weekly homophilus just means that computer scientists are more likely to be friends with computer scientists than mathematicians are to be with computer scientists. But you could have that, for example, one group gets smaller and smaller, but the connectivity gets bigger and bigger and makes up for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so could you have a limit in this setting where in the limit one group has only one person in it? Still has a limit. Um, yeah, I mean, you have to allow self loops. Uh, no, um, no, no, no. You can't because this previous, the overall expected degree inside each group is at least log n. So you have to have uh, at least log n nodes in each group. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's going to be a lower bound on the size of each group in order for this to work. Okay, um, this is a, a theorem, actually, a uh, new theorem to an old paper. Um, so take a growing sequence of stochastic block networks. Any sequence of sets of adopters that are equilibria for some open set of Q. So make look at, at people adopting a technology and let's make sure, so op what does open set of Q mean? When you take integer numbers, like a half, um, in graphs, there's a lot of times where people have even numbers of friends and 
you know, like a half causes problems. So jiggle it and make sure it's also in equilibrium for a half plus some epsilon and a half minus some epsilon. So it's not just a knife edge case. So as long as you have equilibria that are somewhat robust in that sense, then um, in the limit, they're gonna be a superset of the blocks with a probability going to one. So whenever you look at a stochastic block model, the set of equilibria, when we're thinking about who are those nodes that are always acting the same, basically the blocks will be the set of nodes that are always acting the same. And it doesn't say that you know, each block is in equilibrium. It just says that the equilibria are gonna be supersets of those blocks. So it could be the two blocks are heavily connected to each other and they always act the same, but um, it, you're not gonna get a subdivision of a block, okay? So you, you're not gonna end up having things split across a block. And if the sequence of block models is convergent and weakly homophilous, then you can find some cues for which any particular block is in equilibrium for those Q with the probability going to one. So, uh, you know, when, once you have this convergence property, then you can actually isolate and make sure that some block is in equilibrium for some particular Q. Yes? Or when this happens, depending on how homophilous the blocks are, like you have a community protection? Um, yeah, so. The community detection here is, is um, so effectively there is a phase transition. Uh, what the what the size of this is in terms of these probabilities, um, the proof underlying this relies on Chernoff bounds, and so you can get a rate of convergence on exactly how quickly this happens as a function of the number of nodes and the density. Um, but it's a sharp transition. It's a very sharp transition. So basically what happens is um, below some, uh, some N, you'll get that these things split almost always. And then above it, you'll get that, they, that the blocks are going to separate out. Can you, go, can you go back to your homophilic Yeah. So if you, if you have that part, maybe it would follow the epsilon slightly decreases this N. Yeah, we can do exactly. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is a hard. This is this makes the proof easy, um, but you, you it just has to. It doesn't have to be a. This could be an epsilon n that, that scales down the right. It's an epsilon, right. but there could probably be a threshold, right? So there, the question is whether there be a sharp threshold. So maybe there are some, right? So epsilon scales like square root of one over square root of n. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's yeah. fine, but if it scales, so I, I think it's. Um, uh, yeah, it's going to be. I mean, a concentration bounds probably going to tell you some power of it, but that is not. That doesn't mean that in the other yeah, 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 I don't know exactly what it means. Yeah. So is this a weakly homophilous uh, condition? Is yeah. the case where you had um, where you had those three that couldn't act alone? Yes, who always came along for the ride. Is is that the situation for this? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Good point. Yeah, the, yeah. The, this is violated in that example. Okay. What's happening is those two um, have half of their friends in the group right, with right, the right, three, right. and so they need it. You can't get the three. So what this this allows is the B three people to be separated away from the B prime people, right. okay. and if the B prime people are also connecting into the B people at a high rate, then there's no chance to to separate that block out. That's exactly what's happening. Here. And so those three always brought along those two because those two have the you know, friendships in there, half their friends in that group. And so if, if you have like a, a group which might be very cohesive, but then if there's some other group that, that has all their friendships and you've got to throw them into the equilibrium every time you get this group back together. That's exactly what's happening. That, that's what that condition does. I get just on this question. So, it, right in the in the spectral cuts, there's this cutoff phenomenon. With the, the exact, depending on the rate at which epsilon goes to zero, we saw that you can or can't take, I guess, can or can't detect the spin cut. So, I guess there's a mathematical question at least whether those cutoffs are the same or different in this different uh, game. You know, different. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I think the analogy is a good one. I mean, uh, and I, I don't know exactly where the resolution of this is. Um, I mean, I can tell you. So. Uh, let me tell you where the how how we figured out eventually the proof is. So we found this theorem by Dearman and and um, Sturman, which basically what it shows is look at an Erdos Ringy random graph, look at the modularity of it. What's the modularity? The modularity of a graph is 
okay, partition a set of nodes into a couple of pieces or however many pieces you want, and then look at relatively how many of the links are inside those elements of the partition, inside those groups, compared to what would happen if you put the same links down at random in the graph, right? So it's a sort of modular if somehow it looks like these groups have more links than they should relative to what a, a just a purely random process would be. That's the modularity. And so what, the, what they proved is if you have an Erdos Rainy random graph, you're not going to find any cuts in that graph where you've got too many connections inside the, the different parts of the partition compared to what you should have at a random. So that's a it's a theorem that I would, you know, you, you want to, sometimes you conjecture something you think, oh, that's for sure true, but I have no idea how to prove it. This one I can say, yeah, maybe, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Um, but this turns out to be true. Isn't it dependent on P? Um, so P has to be at least the log N. Log N. So we're, in, we're at least in this range where it's at least uh, log N over N. Yeah. Um, so you have to have the minimal connectedness of this. But above, it's actually um, a little weaker than that. But yeah, you, you need some connectedness conditions on, on P, and then you get this, you get this theorem out. So then, to your question, it probably then you are in the detection. Yeah. So, so the reason that this is, uh, I, I think that this is, uh, you know, what, why is this strong? Modularity of a graph going to zero means that basically there's no way that you could have, you know, when you sort of accidentally thrown down this Erdash random random graph, there's no cut you can find that doesn't look like the the links within compared to across just look like they're st still matching the random um, proportions that they should. There's still pretty much P within and P across. And that means that, you know, and there's a lot of cuts you can be making, right? So you can make exponentially different numbers of cuts here. So the fact that, you, that none of those are showing much modularity is the strength of this theorem. And so once you have that, then that says these blocks are really going to operate like groups of nodes that are always going to act the same because they really are going to look exactly the same in terms of their graph properties. And so, you know, you just show that the equilibrium splits. If, if, it, if an equilibrium splits some block, then the modularity has to have um, be bonded away from zero, and that can't be happening if this theorem is true. But is your guarantee per vertex? So you, when you say it doesn't split any block, even you know it's not possible that like five of the vertices. Exactly. So that's why it's it's yeah it, it's yeah yeah. yeah. But if you have there's five five block. Well, well, no, I mean, but the block itself is yeah, but it's, it's it is saying that there, that there's no particular yeah. Um, and, and, and that's coming from the fact that when this P is high enough and you look at the turnoff bounds, then with a probability going to one, almost every, so there's a lemma that you have to prove in this, almost every node in the block has, has the same expected degrees within a certain ratio of everybody else. So there's nobody that ends up looking different from anybody else. In the so I have one, um, you had a first condition. Is that condition necessary for the, do you have an example that shows? Oh, wait. This one, the first one, the any sequence, yes. Yeah, so any sequence of adopters that are equilibrium for some open set of Q or super set of blocks. Yeah, uh, so what's the condition? But there's no condition on this part, right? Open set. Oh yeah, the open set. Yeah. So the problem is, if you hit integer constraints like a half, you can get um, you can get that is another example. Yeah, you can get uh, from, then you can get a, a like really well balanced block where it splits because half the people you know we all have half our friends in it. Oh, I see. Um, but, and, like some of us take the action, some don't because we're exactly indifferent at a half. So it's it's an indifference at a half is the problem. Another question. The second thing, this existential statement: they exist, there exists some open set Q. Can you uh, pin down? Yeah, yeah. Are? So this is done by um, construction. Construct so it's actually done by identifying the set of Q for which this does, and it, and it relates to these relative probabilities in the blocks. So you can figure out exactly what those Qs are. Yes. And what's who is S and the JS? Uh, oh, this is um, uh, Storms, Evan Storms, who's a student, a PhD student at the uh, um, state. Yes. What? Who is Q? Um, Q is that probability, or sorry, this threshold. So we're thinking about these games where this is the 40% or 50% or whatever. So as you vary that threshold, you get different properties of the, of the graph in, the, in terms of the equilibrium. 
or you can call the neighbor. Yeah. yeah. Okay, other results, there's lots of, I mean, so this is just like a, you know, a quick dive into a little bit of games on networks. Um, there's community structures you can do from this, seeding you can do, complex contagion, you know, Damon Santola has a whole book on this. There's not that much that's well understood, I think, you know, about the properties of some of the complex contagion yet. And I think that this is one hope we're talking at lunch about where graph on games can be useful. Um, there's some possibilities that graph, like the, some of the work that Paris and Azdegar and others have been doing um, could be useful in, in actually understanding complex contagion on, on these. Um, you know, equilibrium can be ordered by degree distributions again. Graph on games might be very helpful here. So you can look at these, you know, you can do games on graphons as well as games on, on networks. And then you can begin to understand these properties. And then that can give you limiting theorems on what the structure of the equilibrium might look like along the sequence. Sorry, the graph on games would be something like the different groups have their own mixed strategy to sort of- Yeah, I mean, like so, so each, each node is choosing a strategy. And now I want an equilibrium to be, I'm best responding to the strategies of the set of people that I'm uh, connected to and I get a payoff, which is an integral of the, over the set of nodes of, you know, the actions of the, like, so everything's just to be done by integration as, as opposed to like looking at 40% of my friends, now it's 40% of the, of the friends I have in the graph on. And uh, I want to take the actions at least 40% of my graph on friends do. Is what did you do of a view of? Them? No, not yet. Yeah, we're we're waiting. Yeah. Um, so the beach. I whatever. Yeah, it's, yes. Um, but the the, the graph lines I think can be useful in, in in sort of extending our understanding in some of these things. Okay. One uh, other thing here is this is from the big with uh, with Evan. Um, so this is the Ed Health data set. I don't know if people know Ed Health. So this was connected in the 1990s. It's a bunch of high school data collected in the US, but they have a bunch of the, um, behaviors on the network as well. So smoking, other kinds of things. And you can look at the networks and then you can look at the behaviors and you can see whether or not they seem to follow one of these network games. So another thing, instead of actually trying to calculate all the possible equilibria, I say, well, let's look at this. So this is the actual, one of these networks. The, um, these pink nodes are smokers. The blue ones are non-smokers. And you can ask what game, what cue would actually rationalize this as an equilibrium? So if you wanted to say this is an equilibrium where you adopt, you smoke if at least Q percent of your friends smoke and you don't if fewer, what would be the cue that would actually fit this particular network? Okay. So if you, and what you, you know, you're going to get some wrong because here, for instance, is a smoker who's surrounded entirely by non smokers. So there's some people whose behavior you're not going to be able to explain by, by a game. Um, so you're going to get some errors. And the question is, what's the queue that has the fewer, fewest errors? So just look for the queue that has the fewest number of people who are doing the wrong thing in the, in the network. Okay, I can see that for you all. I think that saying Q should not be plus dependent, but in reality, Q will be plus dependent. Yes. Some people are sort of more autistic and don't care how much friends they have, as of really are susceptible to yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, right, exactly. So what this is doing is not saying that this is, it, is at all what might be happening in terms of these people's behaviors. There's probably a lot of heterogeneity. But what we can ask is, how close can we get to fitting this? You know, so first of all, what's the best fit Q? It's 0.39. So 39% of at least 39% of your friends smoke, then you smoke if it's fewer than you don't. Um, and MIS predicts about a little less than 30% of the behaviors. So that's better than 50%, right? But it's not much better. Um, so it's getting, but it means that there's a lot of heterogeneity. So one question would be, okay, well now let's suppose we put in demographics and we have different thresholds for people who, for instance, have more siblings or people who have fewer siblings or people who are from different, um, you know, income distributions or, you know, there's a bunch of different characteristics we know about these nodes. You could put in different thresholds from them and then begin to see if you can fit this. The challenge is just a uh, histogram. Oh. Yeah, 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 exactly. So the way you do this is just counting. It's, it's a pure, so it's really simple, but it's just saying that looking at these things from this game theoretic perspective gives you a, a way of then trying to back out what's the game that people are playing as a function. And, and it's exactly a histogram is the right way to, to do these counts. You just look at the overlapping histogram and see how many mis people you've miscounted. 
Yeah. So, but how do you know people are not changing? They're friends. They get cooler <laughs> ones through the smoke, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, answer to that. So, uh, we've been collecting data at Cal. We had four years of data at Caltech, and now we have three years of data at Stanford. And we are following people over time, and we're seeing their changes in friendships and their changes in behaviors. And it appears that both go on. So, I mean, there's no other literature on this, too, of, of co evolution. And, and, there's an empirical literature that looks at this, but both are happening, yeah. So you do see people changing their behavior in response to what their friends are doing, but you also see people changing their friends. And so it's quite possible that people, you know, are making friends through the smoking as opposed to, um, so so, so I, I'm not saying that this is a good, valid, I, you know, empirical exercise, go ahead and, and start estimating, you know, smoking gains this way. But it, what it does say is that, you know, if once we understand some of the game theory, it could potentially be a tool where you can take it to estimation if you know enough about the game and you know enough about the structure of the incentives and so forth. Um, but it, clearly, both things are going on. The, the network is not random here; it's, it's adjusting to the behaviors. Is that a question? Yeah, sure. So, do you actually have any results about consistency? Like, if you have one of these network games in any situation? This is on the adult data, which is real data, right? But if the data were actually generated from some model and you played a game and I gave you the, the outcome of that, is there a result saying you can actually like consistently estimate the parameters of the game? Yeah, um, so we have a, uh, we have looked at, at sort of the um, particular estimation techniques. So we, we actually have three different techniques for estimating it and we do, we um, prove that those are going to be consistent estimators under certain properties of the networks. So um, I, I can send you an appendix of that. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So, so in ethnology, people have looked at simple networks model where let's say you have an FS there from GNP. But if I see that I mean is infected, I would say, oh, that's too risky. I'd be wired to somebody else's network. And they study how, how that influences the epidemic. I wonder if you could do something like that for the smoke. I could also sort of, right, depending on whether I like, so maybe if I'm a smoker, I'm the only smoker, and I have all these ones which don't smoke, maybe under a certain threshold, I start to admire that. But there might be simple models that you could have something. Yeah, 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 definitely. I think, you know, developing good models of co-evolution of both the actions in the, the network and the people's decisions on whether to change their behavior or change the network are the ones that are important and um, not well not well developed. There's a few examples out there in literature, but there's not a whole lot. Yes. Um, just like I want to, you know, I want to believe in the game theoretic model, but how it, does the following exercise make sense? I try to learn a single parameter model that is like a black box. Do you believe that there exists one that's in the mirror that's better than the 39% or 10%? Yeah, yeah. So I guess uh, you know, maybe paraphrase the question. So when is it that we think that accounting for these sort of interdependencies and behavior exactly. is important as opposed to just some sort of more mechanical model? Exactly. Yeah. Um, I have sort of two answers to that. One is I I, I think that the um, understanding what model I would want to write down for that dynamic can also come from a game theoretic model. So the part of the way we've analyzed stuff is sort of at equilibrium, but instead you could just do a dynamic where it says, okay, look, I just wait till I adopt until 40% of my friends do. And now, you know, start the process moving and then just sort of study the dynamics. That's a well-defined dynamic and we can study it. And, and so the equilibrium itself isn't necessarily the object we need to study. These also have interesting um, dynamic processes and like the whole agent-based modeling literature is, is based off of, of that to some extent. And, and so I think that, that that's an important you know, ingredient here. And um, just some of the equilibria structure gives us benchmarks to understanding. And, and you know, I, I think part of the reason for going through all this is not so much that it, it's you know, that we want to use these for ad health and so forth, but it gives us a broader understanding of when externalities might be present, um, why things might be getting stuck and we're not getting past some certain uh, amount of, of adoption. How would we go about? So one you know, thing that comes across here is, okay, well, if there's these groups, and I know somehow that, that these groups correspond possibly to blocks, then if I do want to intervene, 
I might want to intervene by putting a bunch of seeds. If I can have a program, maybe I target a bunch of people in the same block because if I spread my seeds all over, it's not going to do anything. But if I can get one block activated, then maybe all those people, you know, I get enough people in that block that turns on the block. So I think it's just, you know, broader understandings, understanding the externalities, the, the welfare. So the other nice thing here is there's actually payoffs associated with this. So at the end of the day, you can say, you know, are people better off or worse off than they would be in some other equilibrium? Which is the best equilibrium? So we can do those kinds of orderings. So I think that that's an advantage of this kind of model, um, but it comes at some cost, right? So it's, you know, but I think that, that that's, those are the sort of nice things about it, um, but it certainly lends itself to dynamics as well. Okay, um, now to the promised one with weights and, uh, and so forth. So I'll just do a quick version of this. So there's, let's look at a linear quadratic model. This, is, this model comes from Ballester, Cal Barmangal, and Zanu in 2006. Um, so what we have is people are choosing an action, some XI, each person is choosing this. And now let's think of this as, as a real number. So this is how much I'm studying, how much crime I'm doing, uh, how, how many years I stay um, in school, uh, et cetera. So it's some intensity. And the, the structure is, and, and now I'm in a graph, and this is the weight that I have on J, and this could be weighted and it could be directed. So I could be, you know, somebody maybe I pay attention to and they don't care who I am, right? They don't care what I do, they don't even know my name, but I pay attention to them. So it could be directed, it could be weighted um, and so forth. And the structure of this is such that I have some direct benefit from the action. Um, so this is the linear part, linear here, and it's gonna be linear here. The quadratic part is, I've got a quadratic cost, so I'm not gonna take an infinite amount of this action. This kills the action off at some level. So it's costly to take increasing amounts of the action. And then there's this social part. And the social part is that I get some benefit from the amount uh, that I take the action, which depends on how much the other person's taking the action. So more weight on some friend and more action by that friend gives me a higher marginal benefit to taking higher actions myself, okay? So that's this, so I've got these interactions between people and that is increasing in the amount of action that they're taking. Um, so these will take, take them to be non-negative real numbers, but they could be potentially infinite. And what's gonna happen is we're gonna have to have conditions on how big B is compared to C and, and how it relates to the eigenvalue of this matrix in order to make sure that this thing is gonna be well-defined and not run off to infinity. So we just need the, the matrix, so the, the C on the diagonal and G and the B and C. Exactly. Well, I'll show you the condition in a second. Yeah. Okay, so that's the model, really simple. And now you just say, okay, let's maximize this function. So taking is given what everybody else is doing, what does a given person want to do? Well, you know, just differentiate and equal to zero. So you get the xi is some function of a plus b times the sum of the act weighted actions of my friends divided by c. So it's a really beautiful model in terms of its simplicity, which is part of the reason it's taken off in terms of applications. Um, so in matrix form, x equals a plus gx, where the A is just the A over C's, and the G is the B times G over C, and this answers Christian's question. So when does this have a nice solution? Um, well, you know, you can write this in two different ways. You could write this as X is equal to the sum of the GKs times A, or X is equal to I minus G inverse A, if it's invertible. Um, when is this gonna be true? So this is gonna be, this is gonna have a nice, well, basically the solution, uh, you're gonna have to have the eigenvalue of this. Um, this is that the B over C has to be uh, less than one, right? So it's gonna converge. The equation that you have is only for the basic point. So make sure that it's the maximum. We have to look at the second derivative that it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, so there's a, a whole series of papers that give conditions on, um, on, on, you know, for more general versions of these games, when you get nice solutions, when you get a nice, um, this is maximum solution. But, so there can be multiple points to these things. This particular game is, is simpler than that, but 
Um, okay, the nice thing about this is that if you look at this, so look at this X function, you can actually write out what the solution of X looks like. It actually looks like one plus the sum of its GKs, right? Um, times A over C. This is what's known as Katz Bonasich centrality in the networks literature. Right? So Katz Bonasich centrality, what you do is you count your direct, you know, sort of your direct connections, your indirect connections, you, you look at all the walks in the network, and then you weight those by sort of this decay factor. And um, the basically what's what's true then is my behavior looks like A over C, which is sort of what I would do on all on my my own in this game without any interactions, plus something which depends on my centrality in the network. And so people who are more central in the network take higher behavior, right? And why is that? It's because they have more neighbors and those neighbors are also, you know, they have more neighbors and so forth. So cats bonuses centrality is looking at, at what's the sort of weighted walk that I have that goes away from me. I'm getting, I get more behavior from that and then they get more behavior from that. So this is bringing in that indirect, um, and it just comes out in a very simple formula where um, it's, this is just the bonus. This reminds me very much of trend, but it seems to be slightly different. Can you comment on how which trend? Uh, yeah, so um, page rank, so there's three related concepts, page rank, um, bonus centrality, and eigenvector centrality. Um, bonus centrality, um, so, Page rank, generally, you're going to have a specification where you take a random walk in the network, but then you also occasionally take um, jumps. The one that is like a jump. It's like a jump, yes. So, uh, but if you look just at the bonuses centrality, it would be like doing page rank without, um, in a connected graph without any, without any jumps. Right? And then this would be like a jump. Um, I don't know the precise relationship between this one plus part with the one plus that looks more like it, looks, it does look more like it. I, 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 I'm not sure off the top of my head exactly what the relationship is. Okay, so this is a you know natural feedback. It captures the network. Um, centrality pops out of this naturally. There's been a bunch of applications of this. So Padakini and Zanu did this on criminal behavior. Calvo, Padakini, and Zanu did study habits. I actually have a paper where we've looked at political, political efforts in the US Congress um, based on the network structure, um, corporate control, drug trafficking. You can do stuff on teen behavior. Um, so there's a bunch of different applications you can do with this model because it relates centrality to behavior in a very um, easy and tractable way. Now, again, it's kind of heroic to assume that this is the right model behind what's actually happening in terms of behavior, but you can put in a lot of heterogeneity and. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, let's talk about that off top. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not exactly related, but it's, um, but one more generally, you can put in individual specific parameters on all these things to fit the model um, if you want to take it to data. Can you comment a little bit when you say, when you talk about applications, how do economists use this model? So is this for predicting behavior, for predicting? Yeah, so explaining behavior. Yeah, so let me give you one example then really quickly on that. Um, so here's the Calvo Padakini Zanu. So they applied this to add health and they looked at, um, they, in the add health data, you have how many hours you study. And then you have the, the network and then you have how many hours your friends study. And then the idea was that they thought that there'd be complementarities. The more your friends studied, the more you would study. And so then they estimated this. And what they did is they just literally took this, um, you know, this equilibrium. So now you have a prediction of what each X should be as a function of A, C, and then implicit in this is the Bs. And so what you can do is you can just say, okay, here's the actual network, here's the actual studies habits, what are the A, B, and C? And then they could look. And so what they did was say, they estimated B over C to be 0.55. It doesn't mean much, you know, it's that big, I don't know. But what, it, what it does is a standard deviation increase in bonus centrality increases your study habits um, by about 7%. So it gives you an idea of people who are more central in this study network study higher 
and there's a certain percentage of study that you know you can come up with. Is that was also really no, no, this isn't causal at all. Um, so, so we have no idea. So, so this is a structural modeling, which means you know we take the model, we take it to data, we try and see what happens, and this is. If this were, if this model was really happening, then this would be would the expected output. This does not mean necessarily that if you take a student and give them different connections and give them a higher Barnes system trial, they're going to study more. And do instruments for some of the behaviors and try and get causal stuff out, but that's a lot more complicated. So if I have more friends, that would increase my Barnes system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That means I'm going to study. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so here. I mean, it depends on whether your friends are studying more, right? <laughs> so this is kind of the centrality of a study network, not necessarily in, the, in terms of uh, friending network. <laughs> but yes. Um, no. But to put in a plug in electric three, we'll see there's been since since this there's been a lot on you trying to use get causal estimates of seeding and influence using yeah. many of these models. And so I'll try to talk a little bit about those. Yeah, 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 I mean, I think that you know there, there are ways to do that. So you know, just taking the models purely at face value is is somewhat heroic, but I think they give us insights to what's going on. They help us understand what policies we might or might you know try um, and so forth. But then we can try to do things and yeah. get causal inference out. Right. And tomorrow you will talk about some of that too. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I ask a quick question? Oh, sorry. I will ask a book. I would ask you whether it's normative for some there's no idea. <laughs> it's normative, you say? No, no I mean, I, I oh. so I think the, these models, any any model we write down is a useful tool, right? And, and we have to understand what we're using it for and why we're using it and when we can take it seriously in terms of empirical work. And I think what it does do in terms of empirical work is to offer some discipline into exactly so the standard the alternative kind of peer effects models would be just to run regressions on these things right you just regress uh, a, a given person on your friends and what you can do is you can look at okay if you just did the usual thing where you regress how much somebody studies on what their friends are doing how much better fit do you actually get from this model and you do get a better fit so so if you look in, in what they did you get a much better fit from this model than you do from just a straight regression model so compared to just doing you know simple regressions of pure effects you you do better now what the ground truth is then requires us to somehow get you know random studying you know done so you maybe you can go in and, and do a field experiment now so now we have a model that we can use we can go do a field experiment and see if we can get some things out and and that's some you know there's there's studies of some of the learning and other kinds of things using field experiments where you randomly tweak people's behaviors and then you can see the adjustments and behaviors of others and you can see whether they match up with these models so i think those allow you to, to get some causal inference out I had a question, and that if we can hold this because it's, we're getting close. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think you know, there's a. I was going to say a bunch of other things, but I won't. So there's lots of externality uh, applications. I think the externalities are important to understand. So just conceptually understanding that means that you know individual incentives and societal welfare are going to diverge. We didn't talk a lot about policies, but you know, in these kinds of games where you have externalities, it does mean that you know increasing somebody's study. Could benefit the, the other people around them. And so there's um, you know suboptimal performance in these games, like the prisoner's dilemma kinds of features and other kinds of things that we need to understand. Um, and they do have systematic features that can be quantified. Uh, in terms of games, there's a whole like, this is like one piece of the literature is games on networks. And then as Christian was, was asking, and other people were asking as well, the, the network forms endogenously as well. And you can use game theory to understand that, right? So um, maybe I prefer to connect with other smokers compared to non-smokers. Um, what's going to happen if I have that preference? How is the network going to evolve? So there's a whole literature that uses game theoretic models to, that's actually how I got started in networks was modeling network formation rather than games on networks. So you can use game theoretic techniques to study that as well. So there's a lot of you know, possibilities for these kinds of approaches. Um, and, and they can be used. So tomorrow, um, I'm going to talk. I'll, I'll talk a, a bit more about homophily, and I'll show you some data on homophily and how split networks are, and then 
show you some imp implications of that. And then we'll look at a learning model where we can understand how the splits in a network actually affect speed of, of information transmission in a network. So I think that's right on time. Hopefully if that clock's right, then uh, time for coffee. <laughs> So even better, we have a reception. Oh, reception, great. <laughs>